Now, uh, if you will stay on, we're going to have another Q&A panel. This time it's moderated by Paul Freeman, so from, from Weaveworks. Uh, and I'm going to call Michael Hausenblas and Matt Jarvis back to, to talk with Kenichi. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Hey, yeah. Hey, folks. Firstly, I just want to say a massive thanks to uh, the three speakers, Kenichi, Matt, and Michael. I thought that was really enlightening. And, you know, I've been talking to a number of customers, and, and one of the key questions that they keep asking is, you know, what does this do for my security? Uh, and I think that's, you know, you, we've got three very interesting perspectives on that. Um, I, I guess one of the things that Michael touched on, but I'd like to get everyone's view on is, you know, the adoption of these security approaches, you know, not only where are we today, but what are the challenges to get better adoption? And, and I think I think there's some good input from all the speakers on that. So why don't I start with Matt? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, what's interesting about this space is it's emerging, right? And I mean, if you, you know, listening to, to Michael's talk about compliance and certainly in 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 the field that I'm in, you know, that the, we're really um, uh, learning how to do this right now, right? But there's this big shift from, you know, what, what security and compliance was, you know, uh, uh, even five years or a decade ago to, to where things are now. And so, um, as the tooling improves and you know and we're certainly seeing tons of innovation here i mean this is why the space is so interesting right is that there's lots and lots of innovation happening and the standards are just emerging about the practice so i i think um you know over the over the next couple of years we're going to see you know these things have a have a, a a much wider uptake because they have to right you know we can't just go oh, security doesn't matter anymore we, it's all about doing things fast let's just move on because that's that's not the reality for an enterprise organization you know so I, I think the tooling on mature you know there's lots of interesting things happening and um you know uh the, it, the process by which we we educate our developers and our engineering teams will will start to happen once once those things start moving brilliant thanks what about you, Kenichi? Have you got any thoughts about adoption? Yeah, I think it's really hard, particularly because we're still in the middle of figuring out how to secure a containerized environment. We're just starting to figure out how to, how to secure Kubernetes itself. But when you add an additional layer, like GitOps on top of that, which is, which is not essentially a framework, but rather a principle or operate uh, or a mindset it changes the dynamics a little bit more so you you have this sort of like you're trying to learn something but also you're trying to learn something else well at the same time so you, you kind of have to get into the right mindset right away otherwise you get really left behind in, but by um how do you deal with this new thing while you're dealing with the other thing while you're, while you're dealing with uh, Kubernetes security, you're trying to deal with GitOps at the same time, it becomes really, really difficult. But at the same time, there are so many developments in the open source as well as uh, even, even startups that are figuring this out. So you're not alone, actually. <laughs> well, there's a lot of us who are still figuring this all out. And there's a lot of room for improvement. I think getting it right is important and getting the principles right is important. And if you're in the right principles and you're on the right track, then I think more often than not, I think you will succeed. That's really cool. And, and I think one of the things your, uh, your fictional uh, example highlighted was the, the, the power that you can get to. In other words, the, the, the potential outcomes are, are very attractive. Michael, do you want to jump in on this sure, adoption question? Sure. So I, I want to echo and extend a little bit what both Matt and Kenichi said there, and, and that is on one hand, it's my pet peeve to say that there are in our line of business, there are no best practices, there are only good practices, meaning that, you know, in contrast to, I don't know, some civil engineering who, who know or, or have learned over hundreds of years how to build bridges, and, and even then sometimes they collapse. Um, 
it's it's simply not possible, right? Customers ask me, but Michael, give me some best practice. Give me something I can follow and just apply and, and you know, I'm good. Like, we are not there yet, right? We What you can do is you can peer up, you can find your peers in, you know, Slack, uh, events like this, et cetera, et cetera, where you can compare notes, where you say, this worked for me, right? And, and also lobby, lobby um, up your chain that you are allowed to share what worked for you, also what didn't work for you, right? Because that's the only way really how we can disseminate and how we can share the knowledge better and, and faster than, than, you know, if we just, you know, wait for some, someone writing a blog and hopefully, you know, once a year you stumble upon that and, and learn it there. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, also in terms of cost benefit, right? Um, you have all these wonderful open source tooling, like pretty much every day someone open sources something, you know, including the uh, cloud providers like ourselves and everyone, right? That, that's great. But it's super hard to stay on top of things, right? Like I, even I, for my very, very niche areas like service meshes, observability and, and GitOps, I'm struggling to really keep up with everything that is out there. Right. And imagine uh, walking your customer shoes who are, you know, bombarded with, with many, many more things. It's almost impossible to, to, you know, keep up with everything. So if you can, again, identify people, uh, peers, whatever you can trust and you can uh, leverage them as a kind of like a filter, like what, what are the things that are interesting uh, you, you should keep an eye on um, and which, which of the things, given that the cycles are so quick that some some of the the projects or or initiatives or whatever at the time where you hear about them they might not even be very much you know there might not be a lot of, of power behind them anymore um because everything moves so fast so being careful with selecting your your attention and your your energy there and, and using your network your peer to, peers to figure out what you should be looking at is definitely a powerful way to go about it so michael that's a great segue for me to just mention if anybody does want to ask these three leading experts uh there's a slack channel called GitOps days if you ask a question there it may well get to them right now um but there aren't any there just yet so i have another question for you guys which is uh, i think one of the really interesting aspects of this is how you how security plays across the build the deployment and the runtime environments. And uh, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts about that. And uh, if, if there are, you know, if there are particular areas people should be looking out for or where, where some new developments are happening. So why don't I start with Matt this time? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, that's the, you've hit the, the nail on the head there because that's absolutely where this needs to play in uh, all through the software development life cycle. You know, I mean, uh, at Sneak, we talk a lot about this developer first idea, you know, about, about making security for developers because, you know, as I said in my talk, we're, we're, when we've, we've merged all of our, 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 you know, operations and infrastructure into our development process. So we, we have to treat security in the same way that we treat everything else within that security process. You know, there's, you, the, the whole idea of having external security folks who are going to look at something at the end just doesn't work anymore. So, you know, it, it's absolutely key that those things are integrated all the way through our process. And, and they're, those integration points are for, are for slightly different reasons as well, right? You know, I mean, you, you've got what the, the giving, giving um, security and compliance tooling right to your developers allows them to fix really early on in the cycle. But then you've also got this monitoring aspect of things, which is super important because things change, right? You know, new vulnerabilities happen, you know, uh, this is a living thing. And so, you know, the, the automation further along the pipeline is, is you know, has a slightly different... Uh, rationale behind it than than just repeating the same step over and over again but yeah i mean I, I think that's the key to to this whole mindset is you know that we think about it as a continuous process it's not just like oh where we're going to stick it here you know we we kind of have to think about it right from the start to the end and and make sure that we integrate uh, uh, along all of those integration points whichever tooling you happen to use but i mean that that's going to be another thing to really think to keep top of mind about when you're making tooling choices is 
can you do these things with it, right? You know, I mean, Michael and I both talked about, can you integrate in straight in your IDE? You know, can you integrate into your CI? Can you integrate, you know, directly into your cluster to look at things in production? So I think when you're, when you're making those choices about uh, which, um, which tooling you're going to choose, those are the questions you have to ask yourself because it, it, you, you really can't do one of those things on its own. It makes no sense. Uh, you've got to do, you know, things that integrate all the way along your pipelines. Very cool. Thank you, Matt. Michael, have you got some thoughts on this? Yeah, and, and that's more on a, on a principled level, because as I said, there are so many open source and, and commercial offerings that I, I really uh, struggle to to pick any winners there, other, other than SNCC, always use SNCC. SNCC is always good, um, always a good choice. Uh, yeah, really, because of their developer focus, it, it is something that, that you know you probably see very often uh, used from the very left end part of, of the, the supply chain. Um, but on a principled level, right? Uh, it's it is uh, sometimes a little bit uh, hard, or or I, I hear sometimes um, objections or, or worries from from people saying like oh you know we we can't really uh, introduce it in, in this in this environment and this is something that I I mean I get it right it's it is um, there is a lot of of, uh, of things of moving moving parts but my my argument is always Look, in the same way that you know we do, you know, you, you do not compile a I don't know Java program by hand into Assembler or CPU instructions. You let a computer program do that. Why? Because it is deterministic, it is uh, repetitive, and computers can do that much much better than you, much much faster. Right? Theoretically, it would be possible, right? I could take that and literally, do, and initially that was done, that was the way how it was bootstrapped. But nobody in their right mind would say, that's a great use of our time. And in the same way here with GitOps, it's like, let us automate the things that machines, whatever you call them, machines, agents, robots, whatever, right? What they are good at. And let's, let's free up that time for us humans to focus on things where we are good at, where until the, the AI comes, we, we still play a, an important part, judgment calls, saying like, yeah, this might not be like formally in policy, but I know that this is okay because of this and this exception. And sure, you could, as I said, that's probably the next iteration that we will be seeing then, um, encode more and more of that domain knowledge and these exceptions, whatever, replacing them by uh, machine learning models that simply can learn just as humans can learn. Uh, but we're not there yet, I would say. We, we are like in the very early days of um, let's, you know, separate this, this concerns humans good at what humans are and, and machines good at what machines are. And let's apply that. Thank you, Michael. Kenichi, uh, uh, you definitely had some aspects of your, of your model that were sort of went across build, runtime, build, deploy and runtime. So, so what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I would use the DJ's name again, desired state. So one, one of the key principles um, as humans is we're really good at showing intent, like what's the desired state of this specific build? What's the, what's the specific uh, declarative definition of the run and then uh, the runtime, etc. cetera. Um, the challenge really is if you are trying to do this um, in the traditional way by any, by any stretch of the imagination, what you end up seeing is there's a lot of challenges for developers to do anything. Right, so when you're automating everything and nothing works because of the security aspect, then <laughs> you become nothing works, right? So it become it becomes really difficult for you to utilize anything or to do anything. And I think one focus that that uh, I, I was showing earlier, why why I focus first on security, not scalability, not speed, not anything else, or stability, because if you have security built in into the developer experience, all the way to the left and every step of the way, then what happens next is it becomes invisible. You don't even see security. That's what my end goal is. That's what I want GitOps should be from purely a selfish point of view. Because if you think GitOps and security and you build something, it's GitOps, it's secure, it's automated. You, you have a thought, okay, so now do I have to care about security? I want security in GitOps to be uh, deprecated 
Like I wanted to get to run out of a job, essentially. I, I want to be a DevOps, DevOps engineer and I want to work myself out of a job. That's what I mean. Like you shouldn't even see security anymore because it's just in there. It's baked in. When you create a GitOps pipeline, everything is secure all the way through every step of the way. And when you get to the end, yeah, it's just there. It just works. That's what I want it to be. It just works. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I really like your your vision of, of security is invisible. That's awesome. I, I would so, agree. I would re- agree with what Kenichi said, uh, and you know, I, I, I still think we we have a few years that at least probably you know after I retire, so I, I will probably still keep my job. Uh, but um, the the point here, when you said you know f- failing, and I think that it, it might sound strange or, or funny, but given that we automate things, we are also able to fail fast, right? So rather than, you know, I fat finger something and three weeks later something fails and there's no connection between these two things, something happens and within, and everything is automated and within seconds, you know, in, in a progressive deployment setup, I see, whoops, uh, there is a, a problem. And that comes from this bug in, in, in the code. And, and because we automate, we can fail fast and we can, this, this learning loop is, is much, much faster. The feedback loop is much, much faster. And, and that also should help, you know, in, increasing the, the security posture and, and uh, yeah, being, being uh, more um, convinced that all of, of what we're doing here makes sense. Awesome. So we have one minute left, right? So if in, 30 seconds each, do you, one last question. Do you have anything you think is coming in the future to improve security for GitOps and around GitOps? Matt, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think runtime detection is going to get super interesting. Um, you know, we've now got s- so much options in terms of instrumenting the stack, you know, in, in terms of tracing in our applications, in terms of uh, the stuff we can get from service meshes, the stuff that's, that's happening in the kernel like eBDF, you know, so this this idea of of being able to detect anomalous uh, anomalous behavior is uh, is is going to get very interesting. So we can actually detect when our applications are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and uh, I think that's going to have a big impact on uh, on security generally. Very cool, Kanichi. I think uh, my prediction for twenty twenty one will be. Um, Every, everything will be fine. Like um, all of these problems we're facing, it's fine now. It all go away because of the vaccine. Oh. But uh, the second prediction is um, the thing that we do around security testing, QA testing, and testing in general will be heavily tied into security testing. That what I mean is writing policies by uh, open policy agents, uh, uh, Kiberno, or also. I think that will be the next uh, the next iteration of testing and QA testing and security. So there will be another role like DevSecOps, there will be like Dev test SecOps. I don't know. <laughs> Love it. I, Very cool. Thank you, Kenichi. And Michael, one last thought. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Matt regarding his assessment around PPF. Uh, clearly, uh, you, you will see that everywhere in, in your service meshes and everywhere uh, happening. And I would also think that many of the things that we are currently still doing on a kind of like higher level abstraction, and very explicit, will simply become part of uh, the fabric, right? You will simply have GitOps, things like Flux, for example, just baked into your uh, Kubernetes distribution that you're just using. You don't think about that in the same way that you're currently obviously using, uh, let's say, VI part of, of Linux. Now I get all the hate mail from Emacs, but you know, you, it's just part of the system. It doesn't, you know, you don't need to worry about it and explicitly install it. It's just part of the fabric of the system. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. And once again, huge thanks to Kenichi, Matt, and Michael for really informative, interesting session. And I certainly learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Thank you very much.